The community quarantines and curfews to restrict people's movements as measures to curb the coronavirus's spread brought economic hardship to many Jamaicans. For the most part, these community-bound curfews and quarantines were ordered in low-income inner city or rural communities where housing of Jamaica's most vulnerable, vulnerable populations existed. This public forum locked down, locked out vulnerable communities during the pandemic, unearthed the depth of the isolation faced by residents within these poverty-stricken communities and how they coped. Coming to you live from the AC Hotel in Kingston, I am Nicole Walker, Director of Programs at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, Capri. Capri is grateful to the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, of the UK for supporting this research, which is an output of the project, evidence-based policy research on COVID-19 impacts, implications for violence and effective policy responses. Following the opening remarks, we will hear from Ms. Jenny Jones, who will be presenting the, the, the findings of the report, then a panel discussion to be moderated by Dr. Damian King, Capri's Executive Director. Joining the discussion are Dr. Dana Thorburn, Capri's Director of Research and Researcher and Economist at Capri, Ms. Monique Graham. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Daniel Shepherd, British Deputy High Commissioner to Jamaica, who will give greetings. The British High Commission in Kingston has had a long-standing partnership with Capri in which it has supported research on some of the most critical development challenges facing Jamaica. Such research generates new data, evidence and informed debate, all of which support effective policy making. We are pleased to participate in the launch of another of the five research papers on the impact of COVID-19 on Jamaica, which are being produced by the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, Capri. Our support highlights the importance of discerning the full impact of the crisis and implications for a wide cross-section of Jamaican society, as well as the Caribbean. The research being discussed tonight focuses on vulnerable communities in Jamaica, home to persons most at risk of socio-economic fallout from the crisis and characterised by high levels of poverty. Studies in several jurisdictions confirm that the necessary restrictions on movement in order to curb the spread of the virus, as well as the fallout from the closure of businesses, have exacerbated the conditions under which vulnerable groups exist. We look forward with great anticipation to the findings from this research and the insights which, we hope, will help inform action that will make a positive difference to the lives of persons in those communities. On behalf of the British High Commission, I wish to thank the lead researcher, the moderator and panellists who will bring this work to life tonight. I look forward to a stimulating discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. We have done a lot of work on the impact of COVID-19 on various aspects of our economy and our society. Today, we are going to bring it down to the level of those who experienced perhaps the worst of it, to the individual communities, to the poor inner city and rural communities that were the victims of both the pandemic like the rest of us, like everyone else, and also of quarantine and lockdown measures. And we want to see what really is the impact it had and how, how it was coped with. And perhaps out of it to see how it can be better managed as the, as the crisis continues. Our presenter tonight of the research findings is Ms. Jenny Jones. And I'm going to ask Jenny now to give you a summary of the report that we are launching this evening. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Damien. Good evening, everyone. We're all too familiar with the impact of COVID-19 on Jamaica. Hundreds of deaths, 
tens of thousands of persons infected and a disruption in livelihoods and economy that has brought the greatest economic decline since the country started measuring. 57% of Jamaican households saw a reduction in income between March 2020, the onset of the coronavirus, and September 2020. And a half a million people received government financial aid. The pandemic has deepened our pre-existing socioeconomic inequalities. The community quarantines and lockdowns to restrict people's movements in order to um, retain, you know, restrict coronavirus itself brought economic hardship to many. And the community quarantines were ordered in communities for the most part with a high incidence of poverty. Those who could access government help during the crisis due to their formal links and banked status would have been better off than the undocumented citizens and informal businesses for whom access was impossible and who were as much, if not more, in need. To assess how persons living in low-income communities managed, Capri carried out a survey of 1,500 community residents in 13 urban and 11 rural communities, 24 in all, across eight parishes. Choice of the communities was guided by PIOJ and Statin's 2019 poverty map. 12 communities had experiences of community restricted quarantines or lockdowns. The questionnaire was administered face to face over eight weeks in July and August 2020, with the interviewers adhering to all the mandated health pro protocols. So what was the economic impact of COVID-19 in these communities? Unemployment doubled. The national unemployment rate rose from 7% in January 2020 to 12.6% in June. But in these communities, the unemployment rate virtually doubled from 20% before to 39%. And you see that in the red band on the columns in front of you. Those in full-time employment were hardest hit as 50% were laid off. And you see that in the blue bands above, the pre-COVID and the post-COVID. Other groups, especially the largest group of self-employed persons here shown in yellow, were much less impacted suggesting a high level of resilience in this sector. Remittances for half of those getting them decreased or stopped. Now in these communities, two out of five receive remittances. Over a quarter, 27%, receive 50 US dollars or less. 50 US dollars is approximately 7,500 a month while almost half received monthly between 51 and 150 US. The rest received more. While there was a national 21% increase in remittances, for half the recipients in these communities, remittances either decreased or stopped after COVID-19. And this is shown on the left hand of the pie here, suggesting that their own relatives abroad are like them not high up in the income ladder. Only 14% from these communities saw an increase, while approximately a third received the same as before, and you see this in the green on the pie. Most whose remittances stopped were also in the category of those who were unemployed since the pandemic. So this would have pushed them further into poverty, possibly severe poverty. This would also apply to the near one in five of the disabled whose remittances also stopped. What were the terms of the government's ambitious care program, COVID allocation of resources for employees? The one-time compassionate grant required a TRN, a 
and a national photo ID. An estimated 200,000 Jamaicans are undocumented. They have no proof of their legal identity. There is an uncounted number who do not have both a TRN and a matching national photo ID. That is the national ID which is required for voting or a passport or a driver's license. So no compassionate grant for them. The one-time general grant of between 25,000 and 40,000 for barbers, hairdressers, market vendors, taxi and duter drivers, craft vendors, bar and night operators required registration with the state agency. The one-time small business grant of 100,000 for micro and small businesses meant that they had to have filed tax returns in 2019 and payroll taxes where they had employees. Well, over 40% of the working population work in the informal sector, including many active small businesses. Other than the owners of licensed taxis and bars, most of those who work in the informal sector and live in these poor communities have never reached the level of being registered, let alone that level of bookkeeping required for a small business, for example, for a mechanic like this with a couple of employees. So those grants were not available for them. The care route for past recipients worked seamlessly since they were already pre-qualified and did not need any application. Their benefit increased by 50% between April and June, 2020. So who did apply for grants and what happened? The majority in this sample applied for the compassionate grant, since this was all they were eligible for once they had the requisite ID and TRN. So here you see the total sample of those who applied, and you found that two, uh, three out of five, 62%, <clears throat> were successful. Then we look at the disabled, the pensioners, those on PATH. Well, the disabled were very successful, although only a third applied. 92% of those got through. Among pensioners, it was 71%. About two in five pensioners applied. And half of the PATH recipients applied, and three out of five received, 60% received. But there was dissatisfaction with the one-time compassionate grant, welcome although it was, as it did not go far. This is the comment of a St. Mary woman from Anotto Bay. The compassionate grant was very little, and with the price gouging, by the time you blink, the money gone. The food packages never reached me, so the little money had to go towards food. The distribution of compassionate grants for the unbanked persons was poorly managed and in a pandemic, dangerous. And this photo from the May 12th, 2020 edition of the Jamaica Observer says it all. The journalist commented below the photo, this policeman seems helpless in getting people outside a remittance agency on King Street in downtown Kingston to practice social distancing. And indeed, if he was on his own, as was apparently the case, he could never have succeeded. It was a similar store, story of poor management from past recipients. This is a woman from a Denham Town um, community. We all know Denham Town. Collecting the path money was bad. The place was crowded and the people behaved badly. I think path should have sent the money via the bank. The system was alphabetical, but people still came when it was not their day. It was chaos and confusion. No physical distancing, some people with children, and no mask wearing. Another woman from August Town said this, I usually collect for my three children on the 15th of every two months from the post office. It's an alphabetical system, but with COVID-19, people just turned up on days when they were not supposed to. In addition, 
the collection date keep changing. Last month it was late. Another challenge was cashing the check at the bank, as some banks were only changing checks in alphabetical order and one bag of other requirements. We've seen the impediments, but we still have to ask, why over half the community members in these communities did not apply, even for the compassionate grant? You can see here that 20% were employed, so they weren't eligible, or they were, and that was actually 12% of this thing, or they felt they had enough, they felt that others should receive. Then there were those who didn't know about it, the largest group, 27%, over a quarter. Then there were some who applied late and missed the deadline. The application time was actually very short for the compassionate grant, eight days from April the 9th to April the 16th. 13% said they didn't know how to apply. And 3% said they had no TRN with matching ID. I'm sorry that the um, script is wrong here. Now, 3% doesn't sound much, does it? But actually, out of 1,500 people, it's 45 people. So you can imagine how much it is out of a larger population. 21% had other lighter reasons. So in the end, just over one in four persons from these communities on the poverty map received financial assistance from the government. So how did people experience the COVID restrictions? They curtailed people's movements and their ability to hustle. And just as a grant distribution was not well organized, nor was every aspect of the quarantine regulations. This is a comment from a woman in Sakaba Gardens in St. Catherine, where residents experienced a full lockdown. Look here, we get shopping days to go conduct our business and shopping. However, for most people in this community, we do not purchase in large quantities. So this system made no sense. To say, go shop in May Pen. To buy what? Buy what money? More so, the initial, the limited shopping hours was most inconvenient. Here in the community, when you need sugar, rice, flour, oil, or whatever, you run, go shop. People do not have money to stockpile, to buy from supermarkets. People here purchase dab toothpaste from the shop. This is our life. It worked for us, and COVID come mash it up. At the same time, school was out. And as we all know, that raised costs. Children needed more food. Electricity bill went up with online school if they had internet, or watching TV, which also had school lessons, or they used their phones and tablets more. For the parents, the pressures could be almost unbearable. Several parents spoke of having to leave their children alone. One explaining that her 14-year-old daughter was now pregnant, something that would not have happened if she'd been in school. Another spoke of her guilt and fear. Me still do our work, and nobody in our home to take care of them. Me know me not to do it, but me have to just leave them. So the pressure was on and still is for many. How do people survive? They told us, backyard agriculture. Two out of five said this was one of their survival strategies. This approach builds up long-term resilience. It may be now for the pandemic, but it's an important choice by Jamaicans for their food security in the context of climate change borrowing money. The national average from Statin was that under 4% of households borrowed money. For these communities, 12% said they had to borrow. And among pensioners, it was 15%. Budgeting, a common strategy for all of us, buying only the essentials. But if this did not work, reducing meals, sometimes to one a day, Adults and children have to make do with snacks and tea or sugar and water for other meals. 
there is a lot more hunger out there. Another strategy in 2020 was not paying utility bills. Despite non-payment of bills, the National Water Commission did not cut off a single household during the first nine months of COVID-19. Sanitization, so important for the prevention of the coronavirus, was safeguarded at the expense of the NWC. Now in 2021, trying to recoup some of their losses. There were two unexpected findings. Jamaica's minimum wage is too low to ensure families can live above the poverty level. Poverty occurs when one's consumption or income level is inadequate to meet the necessities of life. This is marked by a standard poverty line below which it's believed basic needs cannot be met. Six years ago, in October 2015, the international poverty line was updated to US 190 a day. In Jamaican currency at one US dollar to 150 Jamaican dollars, today's selling rate is actually 155. This is approximately $285 per person per day or $8,550 per person per month. This means that a sole earner in a family of four should earn approximately 34,200. That is the poverty line. This means that a family of four, sorry, currently Jamaica's minimum wage is $7,000 a week or $28,000 a month. What this means is that a family of four with a sole income earner taking home approximately 28,000 a month would be below the poverty line unless there were other sources of income like remittances. The other unexpected finding was that out of the 33 disabled respondents in the sample, none was a member of the Jamaica Council for Disabilities, nor did they know about the council. Therefore, they would not know that as a member, they would automatically have received the 10,000 compassionate grant once they applied. And only 36% of this group applied, although they had a high success rate. And the council informs its members of any benefits that apply to them, especially in times of emergency. So Capri's recommendations, with the benefit of hindsight, use local community experts. We have so many of them. Let them be coordinated by the Social Development Commission to improve targeting of the undocumented and hidden poor in pandemics and other disasters. The JPs, violence interrupters, community development committee CDC executives, restorative justice officers, SDC community officers. These persons are all well aware of who in the community is in genuine need. JPs would be in a position to verify this. We know that successful transmission of information is critical to prevent panic and provide correct information to counter the inevitable spread that we ourselves have seen of false rumors and theories. Simplify the information communicated for specific target audiences. Use town criers with properly timed and clear messages. This mode is widely used in rural areas to communicate civic and entertainment events. Use the community development committees, the CDCs, the youth clubs, the senior citizens clubs, which exist in many communities, all known to the SDC, to take information to the community level. Interestingly, the research found that word of mouth, along with TV, was the most trusted media of communication about the pandemic. More than 80% of persons trusted these two forms of media. Subsidies can be provided uh, as these tasks are arduous, they take time, and they take transportation. Proper documentation obviously must be a condition for this. 
use community shops as a focal point to serve the community. As long as they adhere to strict health protocols, including social distancing, access to small community shops and not large retail outfits is what is required by people in restricted communities during quarantine periods. And an additional advantage is that this adds to the community economy. Take opportunities to encourage resilience by, for example, continuing innovations like the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries highly successful backyard garden project. Now, this was, pre this was presented in March of this year. It was oversubscribed. 7,053 persons applied for the 2,500 backyard garden kits. Encourage financial inclusion among PATH beneficiaries. By depositing PATH checks in a beneficiary account where it's available, and many do have uh, bank accounts, or introducing a mobile money mechanism, encourage them to join a financial system if they haven't, by assisting them to open accounts in chosen institutions. This can be one contribution to their empowerment. Include and, ac in and accommodate the disabled in poor communities, maintain a national registry of them, conducted with the Jamaica Council for Persons with Disabilities, and this information will be the basis for special attention during emergencies and disasters. Incentivize small business to achieve some level of registration so that they can more easily obtain help in a disaster. And finally, increase the number of community social workers. They can provide support for parents to protect their children, to learn what is available from government agencies, and generally to cope with their own stress issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. You know, this uh, brings us, as I said in the introduction earlier, this sort of brings us directly and, and closely to the effect and the impact, impact on people at the community level. So it's giving us a perspective on the effect of the pandemic that I don't think we have seen in any other forum and certainly in none of the other research that Capri has done. So for the rest of the discussion, I want us to walk through this to make sure we understand the impact and therefore to get a better sense of what we can do about it because this crisis is not over. We are more than a year into it and the, the COVID-19 virus and pandemic is still here. We have a situation where variants are emerging and it's coming in waves. So we're going to have to be managing this for a while yet. So the lessons that we can get out of this, we still have plenty of time to apply them. We want everyone to participate in the discussion. So I would like members of the live audience to go to slido.com and put in, put in the event code Capri. And you'll be able to post questions to myself, to the presenter and to the two panelists to help us to understand the issues here and to express them more clearly. So post your questions. You can also vote on questions posted by others if you want to encourage us to address those questions because we get more questions usually than, that we, than we can answer in the space of time that we have. We have, as panelists, to help us to sort through this issue, Dr. Diana Thorburn, who is the Director of Research at Capri, is familiar with this research and comes with a background that will help us to understand this issue. And we have Monique Graham, who is a researcher at Capri and has done a lot of work in adjacent areas, uh, an economist, and so we'll be able to explore that aspect of it. If I may, though, before I go to the panelists, I want to go back to you, Jenny, because 
it is it is emerging that all of us in this country did not experience the same pandemic, the same conditions. And what is coming out of this exercise in particular is the beginning of an appreciation for quite how difficult it was in some communities. And so I want us to just, to, 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 I want you to talk about that a little more, to expand on that. When you combine, from what I was hearing, when you combine the job losses and the quarantining and the effect on remittances, taken together, it seems to, it seems to point to a, a fair bit of devastation in some of these communities. Can you just expand on that for me so we know what it is we're dealing with here? Oh, I mean, um, I need to explain that I was not the researcher. Um, Dr. Laura Jan Obermuller was the researcher. I think there still is a lot out there, Damien, a lot of problems. Um, there's a lot of hunger out there. I'm amazed that people are still keeping it together. Uh, and I think some of the, the, the uh, particularly the backyard gardening, uh, is, is definitely helping. In fact, a few people said they were able to sell. They were able, of course, in the rural communities, they can do more. They have more space. They were to, able to sell some of what they were um, what they were growing. Um, but you know, people. Um, I mean, I really. I'm not sure what to say in terms of additional suffering that is out there. Um, I think people are wearing masks more. I think people are protecting themselves a bit more. I don't know what is the case with utility bills. I don't know if some people are still in darkness because they cannot afford those, or some of them have had water cut off. Um, I think there's a lot of neighborly support one to another um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of sexual predators a lot of problems from school not being uh, keep being kept and and this is much more the case in these communities people live very close together there was something the other day there was a fire i think where you had two bedrooms and the number of people sleeping in those bedrooms was unbelievable. I can't remember the number, but I know it shocked me. And yet I know it happens. You know, there was somebody who, who lost everything in a fire and the number of people living in those two rooms. So people are chopped together um, and there's less food. Some people are getting back employment. Tourism is beginning to come back, but by no means everybody has been taken back in. Um, so I think as usual in this country, it's a lot of support from each other, from your neighbor. This is what happens in poor communities, you know. They may, you may hear a lot about fighting, but there's a whole lot of support that people give to each other. Um, I don't know if Diana can add anything, because Diana is also familiar, very familiar with the research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, it, this research is hard for me to look at in isolation and not only in the sense of the other COVID studies have done, but if you think back to the this, this study that we did on NIDS, uh, which was pre-COVID, so many of the issues that came up there at the cost of not having an ID, the cost of not being in the, in the system, um, are really being borne out by these studies that we've been doing on COVID in almost every single one of them, in the tourism study, in the pan-Caribbean study, um, and now here, we're seeing that they're really, the cost of not being, whether it's registered or having a TRN or paying uh, employer taxes, has really come home in this effect. Um, you know, just a few weeks ago in the U.S., a uh, tax credit was announced for families with children, $300 in any family up until the end of the year to try and mitigate against COVID. Those payments, 
people don't have to apply for them. They automatically go to people's bank accounts because they're in the system already. There isn't an issue of people lining up, of people not knowing how to fill out forms. Um, and, you know, this has been a long-standing issue that we have been grappling with for years, um, not just at Capri, but, you know, broadly speaking of, you know, how to get people better, um, better registered, better documented. Um, you know, it came, it's come up even with in the, in the citizen security studies that we've done. And when we looked at the Zosos, the first thing that the Zosos did was to get people TRNs. So yes, the impact of COVID and the study really shows very clearly how it impacted people. But I think some of the bigger issues out of this study are about how do we formalize more and not just to get people paying more taxes, but how to get help to people who need it when they need it. I think we all, and I mean, I think the whole of government, opposition being you know, included when you talk about the whole of government and us too, for that matter, all agree that needs, once we can agree on the details, or some of which are very important, is would have helped and is absolutely necessary for planning. But I also want to point out that I don't think we use our community experts. We do not recognize that the community has experts who are highly respected and who can do a lot to help government agencies. And the Social Development Commission is an obvious one to link with people and to find out more and to help people more. Jenny, and I, I want us to talk, Jenny, um, uh, uh, really in an elaborated way about, about those community, uh, that community expertise, because it's not, it, it shouldn't be just an appended comment to, to, to this discussion. But I want to I want to explore the 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 inclusion and the needs element some more because Diana has mentioned it, you have mentioned it, and you know it happens that we have the person here who is who has done a lot of work on both needs specifically and how it can help to to, to bring marginalized and undocumented persons into this into this inclusivity. So, Monica, I wonder if you can tell us how needs and inclusion can help in, with this kind of situation. Thanks for that, Damien. So, um, in conducting the research on needs, we realized that its impact, its benefit to Jamaicans can be very far reaching. And if we should zoom in on financial inclusion, which was a major theme in the findings that Jenny presented, we would realize that this has implications on persons who are financially excluded. A big barrier to, their being, to them being financially excluded is the high documentation um, that is required. Many of these persons don't have an identification to begin with, which is the initial barrier um, they also lack proof of address. And when we were, you know, experimenting on what was done in other countries, we realized that the countries, they used a national identification system to um, satisfy the know your customer conditions. And this, this national ID, it is robust, it is trusted, and the great thing about it is that you only need that one piece of document. You don't need multiple documents to prove your identity. And we realize that this, once this is in the hand of um, persons who literally don't have any other identity document, it can be their key to um, greater financial resilience because this can allow them to have access to savings accounts, to credit. And you know, these, as we see now in COVID, they're very important to bolster um, person's finances. You know, you know, we've been asked on Slido, what sustainable mechanism can be put in place 
to assist persons in the informal sector to be recognized as formal. So I don't know if you want to be a little more specific about, about you know, what actually can we start doing at the moment to get this kind of formalization going, to get this kind of access going, uh, Monique? Um, well, I will first say that in these unprecedented times, it is important for the government to understand who they are targeting, who are most affected by the pandemic. And if we should look at small businesses, especially those that are community-based, they lack structure, right? They are not, they don't have the books, the accounting books. So them being able to formalize their business is a big hurdle. And they also lack the financial um, resources to do so. And as Diana said, you know, in other countries, you realize that the government, they, they just give, you know, because they know that these persons are in need and Jamaica needs a system like that. In fact, a report from the World Bank, um, it stated that in these times, you know, the government could have eased or temporarily eased um, the heavy requirements to give act to expand microcredit to these businesses um, and curtail, you know, um, I mean, expand social protection um, efforts to informal workers. So there were, um, it's difficult, I mean, to include informal businesses, but for now, you know, the government could have eased the restrictions um, or the requirements rather. And an example of this would be the PATH program. During the, um, the lockdown, especially with the education sector, um, being, you know, um, school from home or work, yeah, study from home, yeah, um, we realized that the PATH requirements, the conditionalities, they were not imposed. The government eased those to give benefits to these households. And the same could have been extended to informal workers. Here, because the government, there, there's an argument for the government to have wanted to, to incentivize formality and to reward formality and compliance. And so it restricted in, in, in many of the industries in where they assisted, it restricted benefits to those who are registered and compliant. Uh, and there's a solid argument for that. But you, you, in a time of crisis, you also want to be able to help the neediest as fast as you can. So there's a real trade-off here and, and Monique, I understand you to be saying that that trade-off really should have been tilted in the other direction towards getting the help, you know, to the neediest and the fastest, uh, rather than the one that they chose. So that's what I'm understanding. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we had gone on to a very important point, Jenny, that you had brought up, which is, I mean, in Monique's point a while ago, she spoke about us not having a framework to be able to identify where the needs really are because, because we don't have a good register of, of who are the neediest, we don't have needs, we don't have these mechanisms. And the point you are going on to make, Jenny, before I sort of interrupted you, is that there is a, there is a source of knowledge that the government could have used which it did not tap into. So if you can just talk about that now for me. Yes. Um, and and this, this source of knowledge, these sources of knowledge are known to a government agency, which is the Social Development Commission. They are the government's community development arm. And they really do know these communities. They're community development officers. You'll always get one or two who are not um, doing the work as they should and not as productive, but most of them are very good. The thing is that they are asked to do everything and therefore they are, they are given too much work. They, the, the JPs, and I, the minister has been expanding the number of JPs, uh, and we obviously, we community must point out those JPs who are, who are corrupt. 
and they have, I mean, we have found some, but JPs are a source of tremendous knowledge in these communities. People come to them for everything, for advice, for filling out all kinds of forms that are needed. Um, where there are violence interrupters, that program has been limited, but I think there are some who are still paid out of um, PMI West, which is in Montego Bay, and those who are still there in the other communities, because once you become a violence interrupter, you know, you can't stop, you know, because people come to you, they know that you have the skills and the, the passion, because that's what these guys work on, to, you know, to mediate conflict and so on. So they know what is happening. They know who's in need. Um, as I say, the SDC Community Development Office, the Restorative Justice Officers, uh, again, Minister of Justice is going to expand those centers. They know people. They're, they're in so they're, they're government agency. And then there are the CDCs, the Community Development Committees that exist in many communities, and some of them are strong, um, who bring together representatives from the youth clubs and the other clubs and organizations in the community to meet and try and plan and bring things together. They know, they know these people. The problem is, uh, Damien, that sometimes these unpaid workers, like the, the, the executives of the community development committees, really need some funding, some basic funding, once they've proven themselves able to organize properly. And again, SDC know this, they have ways of measuring them. They have ways of testing whether how credible they are and how organized they are. Once they reach a certain level, a small subvention to them could go a long way in getting <clears throat> more assistance from them. Um, so, you know, we really don't recognize community expertise. Um, I mean, when I was, you know, a long time ago when I was working with JSIF, this was an experience that we had all the time. You know, um, for example, somebody would, the engineers would go and decide that they're going to run the culvert here. And an old man in the community would tell them, look, once it rains, it's stormy rains, that is not gonna work, it's gonna go this way. They don't listen to him. And of course it happens, right? Um, so, you know, we need to recognize this community expertise and the government needs to use it but it needs to put more money into all of these things. More money so that SDC can have more people. More social workers. Social workers can do huge, can be a huge help to the stress levels in poor communities. Poverty is very stressful. So, you know, both from inside Damien and from government agencies. We just need to put more money into this. We need to get our priorities slightly adjusted so that we can do this. I, start, I started to explore this idea of us not really appreciating how devastating this impact is. And I just want to spend another minute on it. Uh, and it has to do with the statistics not really picking up, you know, the, the, the full extent of the impact. For example, I'm thinking about, you know, unemployment doubling from 20% in these communities to nearly 40%. And, and that doesn't quite capture it because the data you showed, Jenny, showed that informal employment didn't change by much. But it's the nature of informal employment that you continue the activity, it just ends up being less lucrative. And here is, here is a shopkeeper talking about that very experience. I feel slow because um, even though I come out in the mornings early, sometimes when I look after breakfast, with breakfast ready from 7.30, I may still have breakfast at 10.30, 11 o'clock, same way. It is very slow, but it is still an income and I have to do what I have to do still. So I come out every day still and I try every day still because I have my two children, but it is very slow. 
Okay, so that person remains employed. Mm -hmm. So you get a picture now of what we are dealing with. So now that we understand that, and 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 we get a sense of 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 the particularities of the context that we are dealing with in, in these inner city communities, let us walk through now some of the findings and how we may how we may get out of this. Uh, one of the failures, it seems, is a failure of of communication. We spoke about the we spoke about the failure of design or intent by restricting it to those who are registered and formalized. Um, and I use the word failure, uh, you know, not as a judgment, because as I said, it's a difficult issue. But there seems to have been a failure as well of effective communication. Uh, is, is, is that a fair conclusion, Diana? I don't think it was quite a failure. Um, I was taken a little bit by surprise, actually, by how many people had accessed the messaging and where they accessed it from. That, to me, was fascinating. Um, many people got their information. They listened to what the prime minister said. And I found that very surprising for Jamaica, who are usually so questioning of authority. And I think that that really showed that, you know, you know I don't want to, to, to sound like I'm, I'm giving too much praise, but I think that the efforts that the government put into communication were in many ways um, worthwhile efforts um, in the frequency of the communication, the directness of the communication, the openness and the transparency. Um, I think that the this study showed that most people in these communities got the messages that the government wanted them to receive. What was extremely striking was how few people got any information at all from the newspapers. I think it was one or two percent got information from the newspapers. It was majority uh, television and social media where people got their information. And I think that says a lot about not just crisis communication. It says a lot about crisis communication for sure, because in a in a situation like this pandemic or a, a kind of a natural disaster where there is scarce information and where people have to have information in order that they can do what needs to be done to protect themselves as well as everybody else around them, communication is essential. So the lessons here, the data here, and the lessons, what they say for communication, I think are very, very crucial. If anything um, comes to study, I think that that is one of the key things. But I really think that the, the, the low frequency with which people consult newspapers is something that we all need to, to take on. And ourselves, all of us, and the government in, in crisis communication and, and um, crisis messaging. So what, what, what another problem that came out of the research was that the money just wasn't enough. Here's a gentleman talking about that. I get the, um, the ten thousand package. You get a ten thousand dollars compensation package. Okay, and how was accessing that? How did you? How was getting that? Um, my daughter go up on the internet, pick up the information, send it off, and then give you time when. But I'm telling you, it was like a carnival, like a Christmas to get in at the line to get food. And when you got the post office, people push you till you're tired. You know why I access it? It's like one man the way up on top and in calm is saying get a match is swimming and he just ease out and put him in there. So it's a long line. Long line, days and days and days and days. The people collect this different. So the distribution seemed to have been a problem. The distribution required people to show up in crowded places and to do a fair amount of shoving and pushing. Uh, how could that logistical issue have been made easier, Monique? Um, well, as I said earlier about the whole idea of financial inclusion, um, this is very important and especially 
in the COVID climate where, you know, contracting the disease is person to person contact or, you know, um, were persons more, um, were more persons banked, you know, um, it would have been better. The research showed that, you know, one in five persons, I believe, um, have a bank account. And, you know, this is, this is really um, startling. And so there needs to be more effort put um, into financially including persons, especially the most vulnerable. Okay, as we're coming to the end of this, I want to ask each of the two panelists and the presenter to say what is their most important takeaway from this research. And Dan, I want to start with you. It's if we use the people that Jenny has mentioned, the people who are on the ground or however we do it, a program to make it easy to become formalized, whether it's getting a TRN, getting your business registered, that to me has to be an immediate priority. And it has to be made easy because a lot of the barriers, we've seen this in this research and in other research, a lot of the barriers to people getting themselves in the system is a difficulty that it takes to get into the system. Even the thing of putting the thing in, in people's accounts. One of the surprising things out of the research was how many people who are on path and who received uh, grants have bank accounts and didn't get the benefit or the grant through the bank account. And these people also had internet access. So there's clearly a gap there that needs to be filled and it should not be too hard to be filled, but definitely making it easier for people to be registered for me is a number one priority that this research shows has to be taken on. Thank you. Next, uh, most important takeaway, Monique. Um, um, this coincides with what Diana was saying. I think that Jamaica already has the, the social safety net in place, as our previous research would have shown that the mechanisms are here. The issue is as it regards the targeting and access and that determines their efficacy if persons can't access it. And if the persons who access it aren't the, the right persons who should have accessed it, then you know that's a big issue. And we will continue to see um, high incidence of poverty in um, certain communities and just in general in Jamaica that will not change unless the government puts in place a more structured um, and well-targeted system for persons who need it to get it. Jenny, your, your most important uh, you know, point to leave with people. Yes, Damien. Um, well, I think Diana said a lot. Um, the community experts we have to use them much more, and we can use them in a structured way because we have a community development agency who's in touch with all of them. I think there's, um, there's a level of alienation that we have to overcome. People have to see that government wants to help them. If we want the small businesses to formalize, we want to incentivize them, we have to deal with their reservations, deal with their concerns that they're going to be overtaxed, that they're going to have to do this and that and the other to comply. We have to give people stages in which they can register at this stage. And then maybe in two years time, they're expected to go to another stage. But the people, the alienation, the lack of trust, um, despite the fact that um, there was good yeah, there were a lot of people who listened to the prime minister and so on, and, and that TV thing, because they trusted what they heard on TV, most of them. I still think there's a lot of alienation out there, and we have to reach out to that and find ways of overcoming it. And I'm suggesting one way um, towards incentivizing small businesses. Thank um, you, And for myself, uh... the key takeaway to me is that 
the social safety net, which as Monique pointed out, we have the structures in place, but in terms of its efficacy in delivering the benefits to those who truly needed it, it failed. That only about a quarter of those that needed benefits, needed assistance in a crisis. And this is a quarter of those who are already in, in poor and challenged communities. Only a quarter of them ultimately got assistance. And I think, I think that speaks to the failure of our social safety net system. And embedded in this report and its findings are directions that we can begin to move in as a society right now. And that's moving towards electronic payments, moving towards using PATH as a platform for all kinds of distribution, because that's already a register, and taking advantage, as many of these panelists and speakers said, of local knowledge, community knowledge, to identify the greatest need. Thank you for joining us. It has been a fruitful and constructive and enterprising discussion on a really important topic. To take us out, we go back to our host for the evening, Nicole Walker. Thank you, Damien. From the discussion, it is evident that the quarantine had devastating effects on the lives of many vulnerable Jamaicans. The recommendations from the report, if implemented, will indeed prevent such recurrence of these devastating impacts. Thanks to the FCDO for supporting this research, to Dr. King for moderating, to Ms. Jones for presenting the findings, to our panelists, Dr. Thorburn and Ms. Graham. We are also appreciative of our Gold Circle sponsors who contribute to the operations of Capri. This report, Locked Down, Locked Out, Vulnerable Communities During the Pandemic, is available is available on our website, caprecaribbean.org, and is now launched. Please join us for the launch of our next report, which examined the impact of COVID-19 on education in Jamaica. The tentative date for this launch is August 24th. Do have a great evening. <laughs>